evening. Thank you for joining us for this special program. Tonight, we are pleased to, uh, to welcome Dr. Shelly Klein, who joins us from the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. We are honored to host her this evening. And also, she will join us for this month's Lunch and Learn program on the 22nd. So put that on your calendar. Both of our public programs this month focus on Holocaust education as part of the Days of Holocaust Remembrance of Victims of the Holocaust. I'm sorry, as part of the Days of Remembrance of Victims of the Holocaust. Tonight, Dr. Klein will walk us through the rise of the Nazi party and propaganda. Dr. Klein, would you please tell us just a little bit about yourself before you begin the presentation? Absolutely. Thank you uh, for having me here to speak with the uh, Eisenhower's evening is at ease. This is um, always good to, to speak to Abilene and across the those of you joining us from across the country. I am the historian and director of education at the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. Um, and my personal research focuses on Nazi women guards and the gendered perpetration of the Holocaust. So that's what I look at as a historian. Um, in addition to my work with MCHE, I also routinely teach classes with the Kansas City Art Institute um, and the University of Kansas. So I um, like to do a little bit of public history and also um, sometimes within academia as well. So I think when we think about the, the Nazi party and everything that followed, one of the things that I think we miss is how did it all start? And even something about when we think about the Holocaust, we often think about the end point of genocide. Um, rather than thinking, you know, at what point could have people stepped in, we need to go back quite a long way um, and think about how it is that this party came to power. So I'm actually going to back us up quite a bit. So don't don't worry, we'll get to the we'll get to the 40s eventually. But something I want to ask everyone to consider is how much change Germany underwent during um, basically a period of. 30 years or even let's say 20 years if we're talking just right before World War One, and then um, when Hitler eventually comes to power in 1933. But just briefly, I want us to think about what Europe looks like in the 1890s. Um, this is a place where empire, um, the Germ like Germany has an empire, Britain has an empire, there's lots of colonialism happening. Um, but Germany unifies relatively late. It isn't until 1871 that Germany that we know as a country comes together. So think about that just in terms of how really young of a nation it is. And I show this picture here to remind us also of how very, um, you know, these are all little principalities within Germany. So usually we think about one united country, but there's also lots of individual territories that were brought together. And of course, um, you know, they were, in, they were aristocrats that ruled over those. So um, skip over that. This is just a, a nice graphic, I think, of what you know, to summarize Europe beginning, you know, ahead of the First World War. There's a lot of weird tensions happening, right? There's an, a complicated alliance system. Um, this is just a, a fun, I think, representation of these different stressors and conflicts that are happening within the European continent. Um, it's a really complicated time when countries are dealing with industrialization and changing politics, um, and Germany will be a part of this. We can just go through this really fast to just say um, there was a complicated system in Europe at the time. And basically what is important from all of this is to realize that Germany wanted to keep um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire strong because they were basically its only real ally. Italy is in there, but Italy kind of will eventually flip sides much like it does in the Second World War. So Germany's looking around and seeing that France and Britain are very powerful. They have powerful empires. Russia is becoming more powerful and they're all allied together. So to balance this power, Germany wants to keep Austria-Hungary really strong. That of course matters when it comes to the outbreak of World War I. Um, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne goes to Sarajevo, um, where he is assassinated by a man named Gavrilo Princip. And because of that assassination, it takes a month for anything to happen. But a month later, Austria decides that it wants to crush Serbia because of this assassination. And it wants to show to other parts of their empire, don't think you can become independent. We, you know, we're taking this empire thing seriously. So it draws up a series of ultimatums that Serbia has to comply with 
to avoid war. Now, the point of it is they've, they've drawn up this, this set of ultimatums so that Serbia can't comply, because what Austria really wants to do is go to war. Germany backs Austria and says, do what you need to do. That's what's often called like the blank check. So Germany says, do what you need to do. Um, and Austria then will declare war. Why is this important, especially when we're talking about Nazis? Because as you know, the Treaty of Versailles um, at the end will make Germany assume sole responsibility and assume the entire cost of the war. When we look at it historically, how it happened, Austria is the primary aggressor um, in this. So you can see the world quickly goes to war after this. Here's some examples of uh, propaganda from the British and Americans. And I showed these because it's something that Hitler will talk about as effective propaganda. He'll say that they did a nice job of being, you know, dehumanizing Germans, of having a, a short message, and um, he, he will praise it. He will also talk about how ineffective German propaganda is. So here's just some examples uh, of German propaganda. It's wordy. What's with this rabbit? Um, really not inspiring, right? So he's going to critique German propaganda during the First World War, and you'll see how he corrects it. Next, uh, just to say that there's a lot of internal upheaval happening in Germany. There's a, a mutiny in October towards the end of the war, um, and, a, and a republic will eventually be declared. And I fast forward to the end here, to 1918. A republic in Germany will be declared on November 9th. The Kaiser has abdicated. He's gone to um, the Netherlands. And it isn't until two days later that the war itself will actually end. Within the month of November, all of the monarchies throughout Germany will fall relatively bloodlessly. So think about this in terms of where it falls with other European history. In 1917, uh, the Russian Revolution happens, and, and that one is, of course, quite bloody. So people are concerned um, that there will be similar um, communist problems within Germany because certainly the Communist Party is, um, is a factor. Um, Here's just some photos from the revolution that's happening in the following months. And I think these are interesting because Berlin is a, a city that was not touched by war. And so it would have been very odd to see um, men walking the streets with guns in, in open rebellion like this. Some of these are former um, soldiers. Some of them are not. Um, but there's a lot of different parties sort of fighting it out for power in the streets of Berlin. There is a hunger uh, starvation issue because there's a blockade that keeps people, uh, keeps food from coming into Germany um, that's put up by the British and the French. And you can see in this photo here, you have these middle class housewives that are fighting over the carcass of a horse um, because they're starving. And so the conditions in this immediate post World War I phase in Germany as a whole are really dire. Then we have the Treaty of Versailles, which will. Um, reduce Germany's military, make them take responsibility for the war, and to pay um, for the entire cost of the war. So this is a pretty heavy thing to saddle the country with. In the midst of this, we get the creation of the Weimar Republic, and it's created in Weimar because Berlin is such a mess. And when they adopt the constitution, um, it is one of the most liberal democratic governments the world has ever seen. Just a few things about Weimar, because mostly people think about Weimar as being a, a total failure. Um, and in fact, that's the first people to call the Weimar government a failure were the Nazis themselves. Um, and so if you if you still think that Weimar is, you know, nothing but a failure, you have also bought into some of that propaganda that the Nazis were effective at peddling. So some of the things that they got right, um, they will grant universal suffrage for everyone over 20. So everybody can vote, men, women, you don't have to have property. Um, this is even ahead of the U.S. giving women the right to vote. Um, there's elections, um, censorship will end. So there's, there's a lot of changes. Um, uh, but during this time, there's also an uneasy, an uneasy start. If you've seen photos from Weimar, you might think about, um, the money, like this, all of the money that people would burn because it was worthless wheelbarrows full of money being taken to buy a single loaf of bread. This is the intense hyperinflation that is, is probably most famous of the Weimar period. Um, and you can see in 1919, a loaf of bread cost one mark. In 1923, it cost 75 billion. So it's incredible hyperinflation. Um, so things are uneasy during these first few years. 
This is also when Hitler will attempt his failed beer hall push at the anniversary of um, the declaration of a of a republic. So on November 9th, he will declare he will attempt this coup. He means to take over all of Germany, but he never gets out of Munich. Uh, he will be wounded and arrested and finally imprisoned as a result of this. And it's during his time in prison that he will write Mein Kampf. If you look at that November date, this is something that may stand out to you in terms of German history. It's the day the Weimar, or it's the day the Republic was declared. It's the failed Bühler Hall Push. It's also Kristallnacht in 1938 when the Nazi government has this violent pogrom against its Jewish citizens. Um, and then fast forward to 1989, and it is coincidentally the day that the Berlin Wall fell. Then you get this period, which is the golden age of Weimar, which I think is wildly underappreciated. Um, and so you get this period from 23 to 29 where everything seems like it's about to collapse and then things get better. Basically because the US loans Germany a bunch of money so they can make their payments, stability returns, unemployment goes down, um, Germany will even join the League of Nations. So things get a lot better during this period. So some things that the, the Weimar gets right, their constitution protects many um, freedoms such as our own constitution does. They'll expand welfare programs, uh, expand education, uh, take a number of steps to reduce homelessness. And basically the standard of living will rise for many people, especially people in the working class. Still more, it's a great time for women. Uh, women enter the workforce in record numbers. They also go to university and enter many different fields, including medicine, law, science. The Weimar Republic um, guarantees equal pay. And you also see women enter politics as well. This is something specifically that you'll see the Nazis take on in their propaganda. And a lot of the changes that they make to society are focused on returning women to the homes. Also during this period, just still more things that are happening during Weimar. Um, Germany will win 20 Nobel Prizes. Factories will again return to being world leaders in production. Um, there's major advancements across many fields, including physics and chemistry and literature. Um, there's all kinds of art, um, Dadaism, Expressionism, New Objectivity, Bauhaus, architecture. Like this is really a, an incredible time um, for culture. Uh, cinema. In Berlin, um, Berlin and Hollywood are sort of duking it out for the, the cinematic capital of the world at this point. It's not clear Hollywood is going to win um, because there's so many exciting things happening within Germany. At the same time, uh, this is a culture that is trying to come to grips with uh, the war that they all experienced and lost. Um, there's a lot of chaos that was caused by that war. And so you see many artists trying to deal with their experiences either as soldiers um, or things that they experienced just, you know, being, being in the country. Um, these are also pieces that were attacked by the Nazis as being like anti, um, not being patriotic. Um, some of them were even destroyed. It's a period too where some will question is, you know, was there too much decadence happening? Was there too great of a divide between um, the affluent and those still suffering from the effects of war and poverty? Um, the liberal democracy was a, a significant break with the authoritarian past. Um, you do see communism and the communist, you know, party being something that was now, you know, fashionable. Um, and you start to see a divide between those in more urban areas and those in more rural areas. And so those in the cities are much more comfortable with this um, new break with the past. And those in the countryside um, are less so. You'll see in Berlin especially, there was a very vibrant gay and queer culture that existed. Um, if you've seen the movie or the musical Cabaret, you've, you've seen a little bit of that. Um, it, it shows the depiction of, of that sort of, it wasn't even underground life. It, it was really just very prominent. Um, the El Dorado here was one of the most famous um, gay clubs in the, in the city. And when the Nazis take over, um, they will repurpose it and make it one of their, their headquarters. The final years of Weimar look much like the beginning. Um, they are very fraught. They're, there's a lot of tension and attempts at revolution. Um, 
And it's largely, well, it's entirely because of the economic collapse of the United States. So we have a Great Depression, we call in our loans, and then uh, because of that, Germany's economy is destabilized. Since the Weimar time, it has been written, you know, the, the, the popular idea is that it was too much change too fast. Um, when in fact, it was it was just economics that undermined it. Um, and because of this instability, you do start to see the rise of both the Communist Party and the Nazi Party. Briefly, this is just the program. It's called the 25 points or what the Nazis ran on. Um, and if you just look through this list, you'll notice that everything listed here is basically a good thing, right? Now, if you read closer, there are things like only Germans can be citizens, so no Jew can be a citizen. So they definitely have, um, there's there's some racism built in, but it's only a few points. Mostly it focuses on restoring Germany to um, a, a powerful position and helping people earn a better living. So, you know, being able to go to work, have a strong middle class, old aid pensions, education. So all of these things are positive. And I think that's really important to point out because while we remember the Nazis for, you know, the racism and the genocide, and that's all true, that isn't necessarily the thing that they were, um, run, that they were advertising the most in the beginning. Hitler himself will talk about propaganda. I'll just briefly say this. Um, when he writes Mein Kampf, he talks about um, the goals of propaganda. He says it needs to be for the masses. It needs to be simple. Um, few points repeated like slogans. Um, and he will reference the effect of propaganda um, that Britain and the U.S. had during the First World War. Um, He's really revolutionary when it comes to propaganda. He references effective examples, but then he takes it farther. Um, now we just think about this as basic advertising principles, um, but there wasn't anything quite like it when he started doing it. So here are a few of the, um, we'll look at the election of 1932, which brings the Nazis into power. Um, this is a and some, we're going to go through a lot of these. I'll go through them quickly. Part of the point to show you so many examples is to have you feel a bit of the fire hosing effect that people would have felt then. There's just lots of messaging to lots of people. So I don't need to belabor a lot of these images, but I think it's worth it even to just flip through it so you can see um, some of these examples. This one will, in fact, have some um, anti-Semitism there. You can see the snake. Um, with a Jewish star on its head and the Nazis are stabbing it. And from out of the, sta the snake, they're saying, represents all of these things. The Treaty of Versailles, usury, Bolshevism, that's Marxism. Those are often um, synonymous with Jews. So there's lots of things they say that are like dragging Germany down and the Nazis are going to destroy that. Here's another one that's saying, you know, like we're going to break the chains of, um, that have held us back. Here we have, you know, a couple examples of who, um, you know, the, they're talking directly to workers. And notice the um, the way this German man is depicted, um, the body types, or the strong Aryan, um, physically imposing person compared to these smaller people down here that would re represent Jews and communists. Um, and this guy is saying the workers have awakened. We're voting for we're voting for National Socialist. Um, it's a couple of the early ones. Here's another one, um, list one, just again, promoting the, the Nazis. Um, there's one reminding, so you're seeing the, the soldier imagery as well. And here's one that's interesting because they're also targeting women because remember women can now vote. Um, and so if you look at these posters compared to some of the others, um, they're a little softer, but there's still um, simple messaging. And this one says millions of men without work, millions of children without a future, save the German family. This image is actually very unique because, and we'll see later examples, it's one of the only ones where you'll see a depiction of the family where the mother is in the uh, position of prominence. Usually it will be that the, the father is, you know, hierarchically important above everyone else, but this is showing the despair that has happened. Um, so that the woman is, is overlooking, the, and it's, it's targeted, to, uh, targeting women. Here are some targeting workers. And especially in, in, you know, many of these, look, there's no swastikas. There's no swastikas. So we think about how, you know, when the swastika is very prominent and when they're really just trading on this message of what the party can do for you. And this is, this one says, um, 
we're for Hitler. Um, we want to elect the front soldier Hitler. So reminding people that Hitler was a World War One vet. Um, but this image here could look, you know, this this idea of like workers and people without hope that could be a breadline in the U.S. So there's nothing very specifically Nazi about either one of these. Uh, again, thinking about, you know, the well, they're they're talking about the, the Nazi fighters from before, and they were sacrificing. They'll also target students. Uh, that's a group that they're never quite confident that they've really they've really got. Um, but very positive messaging here, right? So it's just like it's they're trying to hit all areas of society. And here again, you know, freedom and bread. That's the slogan. Freedom and bread. Our last hope is Hitler. So again, you get this sort of hopelessness, um, which could be uh, again people out of work in the U.S. during this time. But freedom and bread, this gives you a more, you know, hopeful view, uh, work and bread, work freedom and bread. So these are the things that he keeps repeating um, and the party keeps repeating that the Nazis are going to bring to people. Vote for the Nazi party, we'll put you back to work, uh, we'll restore freedom, you can, you know, food will be abundant. Just a few more, these are targeting farmers. And I, I, I know we're going through a lot of these, but I really want you to see how effective they were at targeting all these different areas of society. They're really speaking to, you know, everybody. Um, and here we have one that's specifically talking about Hitler. He runs to be president against Hindenburg and loses. Um, so because he loses, but the Nazi party wins some seats, um, he's then appointed as chancellor, but he originally wants to be president. Um, this is a sort of a fun one, just talking about the, um, you know, open the door to freedom, put a strong man at the helm out of the swamp, um, forward with the powers of renewal. So they're talking about a real change. These two are interesting because we see victory over Versailles. So again, reminding people of how humiliating that Treaty of Versailles was and that Hitler's going to undo it. This one trades very much on Christian imagery. Um, so they're saying, you know, over 300 National Socialists died for you. They're talking about this failed beer hall push, um, but they're very clearly co-opting uh, Christian imagery. These two are um, speak to Hitler running for president when they have to have a runoff election between Hindenburg and Hitler. Now, Hindenburg was a World War I hero. Um, and so he makes one radio speech. Hitler goes across the country, flies, he gets in this little plane and flies all across Germany to a lot of places that were traditionally ignored by politicians. So, you know, we know, flyover country. And he makes all of these stops to sort of drum up popular um, appeal. He ends up losing that election, but it does um, give him ra a name recognition throughout the country. And I only show this one here with his weird head because this was one of the examples of this was supposed to be like super modern and edgy propaganda because it's like you know high-tech photo shopping here um for the 1930s but it seems to us just super creepy it's hitler's head floating um but at the time it would have seemed like very modern and edgy in the election of 1932 um the nazi party will win 37 percent of the national vote you can see that in 1928, they only had 2%. In 1930, after the crash, um, there's now 18%. But in 1932, they get 37%. This is the largest vote the Nazi party will ever get in a free election. I can't stress that enough. We often assume that the majority of people voted for the Nazis in some sort of a landslide victory because they were all hyped up on anti-Semitism. 37%. It's not a majority. Um, but they were the largest minority party in the Reichstag. Because of that, their leader was able to be appointed as chancellor. Hindenburg did not want to include Hitler in the government. He thought he was a radical who would destroy the government. Um, but he was convinced that if he brought him inside, Hitler would be more moderate. Um, but it's a really powerful message. 37% voted for the Nazi party. The rest of Germany didn't. Um, and once Hitler was in power, um, they started making changes that made it impossible to get them out of power. So quickly, let's look at and think about this too. If only 37% voted for them, they want to have a fair amount of programs and propaganda that win other people over to the party. They want to encourage um, the right kind of Germans, right? The Aryans that they, they consider part of the Volksgemeinschaft. Um, they want them to embrace this. And so 
the next section, I'm going to show you a lot of positive propaganda that we don't normally think about. This is aimed at who they want to include in this racial community. One thing they institute is a program called Strength Through Joy. Um, and that basically means they're going to organize workers free time as well as their like working time. But on the plus side for workers, it means that working class and middle class people can go on cruises and other types of holidays and vacations that were really traditionally reserved for more wealthy people. And it also has the effect of stimulating the German tourist industry. So you see here just some um, some posters for people who are basically going on holiday sponsored by the state. You could go on a cruise. They had special cruise ships that were commissioned just for um, the Strength Through Joy program. So you could, here's a menu. Um, you could have some good German food, and then you might hear a lecture. And, you know, so there's always going to be some sort of, um, you know, propaganda about the party happening as well. And you're supposed to have warm feelings about the party because they've put you on this nice cruise. There were concerts that they organized. And look how pleasant, the you know, this sort of propaganda is, you know, it says, you know, go on a hike, take your, you know, take your girlfriend on a hike through the woods, appreciate the pastoral beauty of Germany, um, that sort of thing. The Volkswagen, um, as many of you maybe know, that the Volkswagen was a, an idea of, of Hitler's, and he wanted every person, it was a people's car, every person should have a car. Um, and there was even this program that they started, so if you, you know, every week you'd, you'd make a minimum payment, and then um, at the end of a certain period of time, after you filled up your little book with stamps, you would get a car. Um, well, no one got cars because before any cars could be made, uh, the war broke out, and so the Volkswagen factory transitioned to making vehicles of war. So a lot of these workers were paying into a program, never got any cars. So the Volkswagen often associated with the Nazi regime, none were made until after the war. You see festivals um, often emphasizing this sort of common folk past of Germans. So they're, they're meant to be very traditional. Here's a women's magazine, which is, you know, again, showing like, oh, we're having a nice May, you know, a May Day celebration. Everyone's, everyone's a part of this community together. For that purpose, they have rallies and marches. These are things that you're probably familiar with thinking about, you know, the Nuremberg rally of, you know, 35. It's famous photography. This one here is actually the opening of the Volkswagen factory. So everyone's like, well, we're getting cars. No, no one's getting a car, but they're all there to celebrate the fact that someday they're going to have a car. Films, Lenny Riefenstahl was one of the most famous propaganda filmmakers. Triumph of the Will and Olympia were two of her, her biggest films. And then we start to see ways that the, the state is advertising the structure of the family. So think about when I said Weimar was this fantastic liberal time for women where they can go to school and get equal pay. Um, the Nazis actually put a lot of men back to work by removing women from the workforce. Um, they also limited the amount of women that could go to higher education and the majors that they could undertake. So you start to see this, um, this traditional view of women being reinstated, where the woman is the mother, um, she's supposed to have a bunch of kids. And in these images, this is one of um, you can always see that there's, you know, the man at the, at, you know, sort of the, at the top, um, and then there's always the state. So the eagle is to represent the Nazi state, and here the family is literally within the wing of the state. Um, there's always several children. Um, often there's a child breastfeeding in these photos, uh, or these these uh, images. Here's a few more. Women would, of course, get. Um, sort of awards and tax breaks, the more children that they had. Um, they will emphasize the biological destiny of women, like basically women are, are their, their destiny is to have children, have lots of them, and to be the first teachers of children in um, like folk ways in German culture. People who fall within this Volksgemeinschaft can then also be aided by the state. And so this was a program, this winter um, help program. You can see this, this little red can here is something that um, typically Hitler youth boys would go around on Sundays and collect money from people because on Sundays you were supposed to eat this one pot meal. Um, and so there's lots of 
uh, lots of advertisements and propaganda showing this one top, one pot meal. So on Sunday, you don't have a big roast and fancy dinner. You should have a really um, sort of conservative meal, make it all in one pot, and then all the money you saved, you should then donate to families who are in need. And so every Sunday, there would be these Hitler Youth kids that would come by the house, and you would have to give uh, a donation to that that winter uh, relief fund. But there's lots of these photos where you can see, you know, this community that they're emphasizing. Here's another one. In Berlin today, we eat um, this Eintop uh, pot, this one pot meal. So you can see everyone's, it's, it's kind of a festival atmosphere. Everyone's having this one pot, everyone together. And this one too on Sunday with the Fuhrer. So even, even Hitler um, is saving money and doing this one pot um, one pot meal. So you can see they're emphasizing the sense of community. Um, and this one says, don't, uh, don't spend, sacrifice. Then we have to think about what they were trying to do with youth, because um, as you can say, Hitler sees here, um, what he wants from, from, Hit from the, the German youth. They have to be slim and slender, and they need to be strong and hard. Um, they realize that not just like, you know, this is the new type of people, but also kids are very malleable to what you can put before them. So they, um, you're very familiar probably with Hitler Youth, which was a program that targeted boys. And then there's the girls version or the BDM um, that was a, a similar structure for girls. And I like to show especially pictures of the BDM because we typically think just about boys. Um, but these are, there are many reasons why they wanted to target the youth. In the beginning, there, it's not a huge movement, but it starts to grow, especially um, after they ban other competing youth organizations and they make it mandatory. So there comes a point where if you were a child in Nazi Germany, you would have been a Hitler Youth member or a BDM member simply because it was mandated. Here are some of the girls and you can see these kids appear to be like hopeful and happy. These, uh, for the girls, they had these things called home evenings where they would go to a, you know, like their, their leader's house and they would talk about, there'd be some Nazi worldview stuff, but mostly they did physical activities um, and talked about Hitler's life and his leadership as well. It was more controversial to have these groups for girls than it was for boys. There was lots of youth groups for boys, um, but the Nazis were a little ahead of their time and wanting to organize girls as well. And then here are just some photos that you can see of them having a good time at these like camp-like acti activities. This one is obviously a stage propaganda photo. I think it's really, it, it says so much here because you can see um, the boy has brought his like torn little uniform for the, the girl to fix. So here she is performing her, her female duty as a seamstress. So she's there to, to repair the clothes of this boy um, and like, you know, future role that she'll play as a wife. And then above her, Above them, it says, we follow you. So Hitler is sort of showing the way. Um, but there's there's so much there in that photo. More festivals for kids. Again, I like to show these photos because there's to these kids, when they remember it, a lot of what they remember is simply the fun that they had. Um, the ideology is there, but mostly they think, oh, we got to go camping. Um, for women, it's the girls, it's way less fun for them because mostly um, they're learning how to be mothers. Um, there's a kind of a mass babysitting program that these BDM girls have to embark on. So for mothers who happen to be working, um, these BDM girls will take care of their kids. Um, all of this is, is aimed towards training them to be mothers, even, even sports. Um, because again, all of this, the, the formula works down because a healthy nation, a healthy nation is built on basically healthy girls and women. More happy photos, camping photos, and then the magazines. Um, so, you know, very much focused on folkways, traditional um, farming. And then as the war comes in, we start to see women being um, shown as, as nurses and whatnot. And then, um, again, this could be, this one here is basically like the German version of Rosie the Riveter, right? It's, it's there, um, that side of the war, women doing war work. Um, I deleted some of these. Sorry about that. And we get the boys version. So the, the Hitler youth, um, very much like a boy scout here, boys magazines also emphasizing like fun and adventure outside times with your friends. Um, 
that sort of positive thing, but also very much military training for the future. The flip side of all of this is who's excluded. And so this woman here talks about how she joined because she liked the idea of being part of a community. She never considered what it meant um, for those who were not included in the community. So here we have now the excluded. This stuff should look far more familiar to you. These are groups of people who would have been considered enemies of the state, who the Nazi state either wanted to remove or change so they would no longer be a threat. And so now we'll see some, some propaganda that's based on um, based on that exclusion. So some of the first people targeted within the German state were disabled Germans, um, people who maybe had hereditary deafness or blindness, um, any sort of mental abnormality. Um, also could have, there's lots of catch-alls. You also just could have been like a poor woman that, you know, a more wealthy man didn't like. Um, then you get images here that are showing basically how expensive non-healthy people are to the state. And so you can have a whole family for the cost of this one person who um, they will eventually say is life unworthy of life. So we don't need to belabor these, but you can just see how graphic they are, um, how they dehumanize the people in them. Um, and again, this repeated message of if these people with illnesses, they they cost us money. They're a drag on healthy society. And eventually this is how they are able to institute a program of euthanasia, um, where they start sterilizing and killing people that they determine to be life and worthy of life. Here's just a few more. This one is also ridiculous if you look at the number of like the, the tallies um, in terms of uh, how many people this woman was was offspring she had but the point is again showing like women are important in terms and uh, of what they produce so they need to be producing the right sort of person another one aimed at that um, they will also target the the roma um, sometimes they're referred to as gypsies but we they should be properly called roma or sinti they too will be persecuted for racial impurity Soviets are also targeted um, as being a lesser order of people. Then we have some that will start to talk about Jews. You can see, you know, behind the, the you know, the enemy behind everything. These are some um, ones that sh they would have, this propaganda would have been in more Soviet territory. Um, so they're trying to say that, look, behind um, you know, behind the face of the Stalin is actually the devil, and the devil is Jewish. So that long-standing anti-Semitism there. There's more of these to show how widespread this is. And then now we get to the Jewish stuff. We will see, in addition to the propaganda, um, they will separate Jews and non-Jews. So they boycott German Jewish businesses, which doesn't go well. Uh, Non-Jewish uh, Germans are really just not ready for it and not that interested. They will make it harder for Jews to be Jews and harder for Jews to be German. So they're starting to separate out Jews and non-Jews during this time period. Eventually, they will make it illegal. Well, they'll strip Jews of their citizenship, and they will make it illegal for Jews and non-Jews to marry. So this photo here would be someone that they would consider to be um, an interracial couple. So his sign says, um, as a Jew, I only take girl, German girls to my room, and hers says, as the grit... Uh, I am the greatest swine, I only sleep with Jews. But notice how public that is, right? They're trying to make a stand to show like, this is no longer acceptable. Uh, they target children um, in terms of um, their messaging. But here's just a few more that are showing this, what they call race shame. And people who would have transgressed against this, these are all women that probably had relationships with Jewish men, they would be publicly humiliated like this. They would, their heads would be shaved or holding signs that say like, I'm being kicked out of the Volksgemeinschaft. Um, very public in terms of what they're doing. Just a few more of these. Um, this is a children's book that was um, produced to show in, you know, both the images to dehumanize um, Jews and also show some of the dangers as well. Um, that they will, you know, stranger danger is included here, right? Um, obsession with money, kosher slaughter, um, lots of things are, are, are captured. But the point is, um, 
this is a book that's produced for kids. Here's another one, another children's book. Um, and you can see these depictions um, and the contrast between this Aryan body and the Jewish body and that sort of thing. And we can, when we, when we take questions, we can go back to some of these if you want. Um, and here's just a few more. These are interesting because these are done in 43 and 44. By the time these posters are produced saying that the Jew is the prolonger of war and um, the blaming Jews for the war, by 1943 and 44, most of Europe's Jews are already dead. So they're, they're still drumming up this fear about the power of the Jews, even though they've already, um, they've already killed almost all of the Jews that they will in the Holocaust. Here's a few more showing um, the power of the Jews and sort of ensnaring the globe. Note, again, the dehumanization you see in the, the octopus character. Their Sturmer was one of the most famous um, anti-Semitic propaganda sheets that were published. Um, and you can see this one is referencing blood libel or this idea of the Jews were killing Christian children to use their blood. Um, that's a similar reference here. But this is, um, these were some of the most graphic um, that were published. And these would be not only like you could just, you could buy them in a newspaper stand, but they also would put them up um, kind of like on a bulletin board. So even if you couldn't buy the paper, you could still see these images. And lastly, uh, this is the last sort of point I'll make. Um, we think about the aftermath. Here's the, the bombing of um, Dresden. And here's just a few. So, you know, front city, Frankfurt, and trying to inspire people that in the ruin that is Germany, like Allied bombs are destroying it, like you still have to hold steady. Um, and so we often think about the bombing, especially of Dresden, right? If you we were to say, you know, what is the story of Dresden? That's where the Allies went too far and too many people were killed. And um, it was like the worst of the, of the bombs. Um, when in fact, uh, that too is a message of Nazi propaganda. Goebbels is the one who sold um, that message during the war and certainly it got picked up after the war. There are many other firebombing um, incidents that, that happened across Germany, particularly Hamburg, where more people died than in Dresden, but it's Dresden that the Nazis sold as this ultimate act of, of allied aggression. And that's something that um, we've continued to, to sell, I think. Um, and these last photos, like this is, this is Hamburg, it's not, um, it's not Dresden. So there's plenty other cities, but we don't think of those. It's, it's Dresden that captures, captures our attention. And then in the immediate post-war period, you see um, the ally, you know, America and, and other allied powers trying to then sort of undo some of this propaganda and saying, like, this is your shame. And you see the the replacement of, you know, Adolf Hitler, Strasse now be replaced with another street name. So they're sort of like denazifying um, the geography of Germany. And then people are are forced to watch a lot of the liberation footage if they are not sent through a camp, um, you know, that's been liberated to see the, the dead, um, they would have been forced to watch newsreels, which would show that as well. And here we have, again, these are all produced to, to sort of show Germany as a whole um, what the government has done in their name. And then lastly, this is my, my last slide, so you can, talk, you can start to open it up here for questions. Um, thinking about the lasting impact of Nazi propaganda, um, and I especially think about that in terms of how we view Weimar, how we view Dresden, um, but then also we've often forget about the positive stuff um, that would have encouraged people to be a part of that racial community. Uh, we often think about just the exclusive stuff because that's what became the most famous. But in terms of during its time, what had the most impact, um, I think we have to take again a look at the, the positive stuff. All right, I will stop my share. I know I went through a ton of that. I said I, there we go, good. So I know that was fast, it was a lot of images, but I thought it was probably better to fire hose you. And um, then we can take any specific questions you have about, about any of that or images that you'd like to know more about. Well, I do have a question. Um, on one of your slides, they were talking, where they were talking about the role of women. I saw where it said, if for women who couldn't have children, they should practice spiritual mater uh, maternity. What is that? I mean, this is a general practice. But even if you biologically can't reproduce, you should be um, aiding the, the larger aims of the state so you can help other people with their children. Um, 
that sort of thing. So you're practicing or you're teaching other German children um, about German history and folklore. So you're, even if you're not yourself reproducing, you're acting um, in accordance with those other parental um, duties. I know okay. that I know that we were here to talk specifically about the Nazi propaganda, but I'm curious how the changes in art, art direction, art design um, flowed. What, did, which way did it flow from the from the art sphere to this way? How did it? What's that? So, in terms of like, how were these artistic movements that predated the Nazis influencing their propaganda? Yes. One thing that's interesting is that Hitler himself largely rejects modern art. Um, he was an artist himself. So I think, if anything, it makes people more sort of aware of art. But in terms of form, I, I don't know that it would specifically have a huge impact because he was so opposed to the current stuff that was happening during Weimar and even had exhibitions of degenerate art that were examples of modern art to show like, this is what we don't wanna do. We don't like this. Um, but it is true that a lot of his messaging is very modern in its simplicity and it's, you know, the way it's kind of clean. Um, I, I don't know that there's a more specific artistic form connection, but that is a really good question. And one that um, I would be happy to look into with some of my art colleagues. Thank you. Uh, we went to a Bauhaus exhibit and so that was in my mind. Um, so Sammy put a question in the chat. Sammy, I don't know if you'd like to go by two names or one, so you can correct me by that. Um, Sammy writes, what do you think was Germany's most popular positive propaganda that was created? I would say probably the strength through joy um, propaganda, the, the program that would send everyday people on vacations. Um, so I think that and it also created, you know, you you got to feel special, like you were a part of something. You're you get to go on a cruise. You get to go um, attend this concert. So I think that those programs were were the most popular, and ones that, um, yeah, I think that's what. And they went for quite a long time, and it gave people opportunities they wouldn't have had without the state. It's a good question. Any other questions? Anyone on the phone have questions? Okay. Okay. I always feel like when I give this talk, I always feel like, oh, you've just been blasted with propaganda. But I think there is something to really being like inundated with it. Like it just boom, 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 one after the other. And the last thing I, I would like to make sure I say, even though there's all this propaganda floating around Germany in this time period, that does not mean that people were brainwashed. This was a literate, educated society that had choices about the information that they consumed. And so I think that's something in terms of like lasting lessons we have to think about. We have to be critical about the information that comes to us. Who is giving it to us? For what purpose? Um, and thinking about that big picture. But so often people want to say, oh, the propaganda, they were brainwashed. They were not. Saying someone is brainwashed removes personal responsibility. Well, if there aren't any more questions, just I have a few more things uh, before we close out tonight. Um, first of all, let me say thank you, Dr. Klein, uh, for your presentation. We really appreciate it. I've learned a lot. Um, tonight's program is sponsored by the Eisenhower Foundation with generous, generous support from the Jeff Cope Foundation. Our next program, Thursday, April 22nd at noon, we are pleased to have Dr. Klein return for our Lunch and Learn program where she will talk about Americans and the Holocaust. And then on Tuesday, May 11th, we have our book club chat at 7 p.m. Central. And our book selection for May is Not Without Laughter by Langston Hughes. Um, sorry, we have one more comment from Kayla that says it was a fasc fascinating, as someone who studies World War II, I only ever knew about the very pointed and negative propaganda. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. So there are, I'm sorry, go ahead, Don. I would like to just say thank you to our guests. Um, you know, during this time period when everything's been virtual, we have really learned to show grace and patience with each other. And I am personally grateful for that tonight. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, thank absolutely. you so much for your patience for sticking with us.
And if there aren't any more questions or comments, then I will say one more time, thank you, Dr. Klein. Thank you to the audience. Hopefully we'll see you again at our Lunch and Learn. And everyone have a wonderful evening.